Good morning. A warm welcome from Cliff Decker Hofmeyer at this webinar hosted by our Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fishing Sector Group. We thank you for your attendance today. My name is Andre de Lange. I'm a director in our corporate and commercial practice and I am the head of the sector group. I practice from our firm Stellenbosch and Cape Town offices. CDH's newly established agriculture, aquaculture and fishing sector groups bring together a number of our practitioners from different practice areas aimed at providing our clients in this sector, in these sectors with a seamless legal offering. For more information in respect of the sector group, please refer to our, web, our, our brochure that can be found on the CDH website. 1 January 2021 was set as the starting date for the commencement of trading under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. One of the main objectives of this agreement is to create a single African market for goods and services. It will bring together all 55 member states of the African Union, covering a market of more than 1.2 billion people. In this webinar, our panel of experts will unpack the latest developments in respect of the African continental free trade area and the opportunities that it presents to agriculture in South Africa. I would like you to introduce you to our esteemed speakers, Trudy Hudsonberg, Wandile Sheshlobo and Jacqueline Ferris. Now, Trudy is the Executive Director of Trade Law Center or TRALAC which is a public benefit organization based in Stellenbosch with the objective of building trade law and policy capacity in Africa. Trudy's work centers around international trade governance, focused specifically on the African trade and regional integration agenda. She designs and delivers training courses on a range of trade related topics. Trudy also serves on the World Trade Organization's Chairs Advisory Committee and is a member of the Committee for the Development of the United Nations e Economic and Social Council. Wandile is the Chief e Economist of the Agricultural Business Chamber of South Africa and is also a member of President Cyril Ramaphosa's Economic Advisory Council. Wandile is a prolific writer, writing amongst others for the Business Day, and is also the author of Finding Common Ground, which I can highly recommend for its very pragmatic and facts-based approach to the challenges and opportunities facing agriculture in South Africa. Jacqueline Ferris is a director in CDH's dispute resolution practice in Johannesburg, providing dispute resolution, risk advisory and regulatory services in South Africa and various other African jurisdictions. As we speak, Jacqueline is joining us from Lesotho. He has particular experience in arbitration, both domestic and international, and, interna and international trade and investment law matters. Jacqueline will act as the facilitator of this webinar. After this webinar, each attendee will receive a pack with the slides of the speakers that do have slides and other relevant information in respect of, the, of this webinar. Please submit any questions that you might, might have by typing them into the question section on the Teams platform and our panel will deal with them during, during the course of the webinar. Jacqueline Ferris will be our first speaker today, so I now hand you over to Jacqueline. You're on mute, Jacqueline. Uh, good morning to all my uh, all the participants and also to the fellow speakers. Uh, thank you for taking time to join us um, for this webinar, and also thank you to Andre for that uh, introduction um, of the AFTFTA and the intention behind the seminar, and also our exceptional speakers that lined up for this morning. So I will be both moderating the session and just giving a brief introduction um, in terms of what AFTFTA. Yeah, for, um, for our clients and prospective um, interested parties on the African continent, on the African continent, uh, from an investment perspective. Um, as Andre also mentioned, I'm joining you from before the from Lesotho. Uh, Lesotho 
um, an interesting fact. They're also uh, a member of the AFDFDA. They ratified uh, the agreement in November last year. So they are one of the 36 members of the AFDFDA. Another, another interesting fact about Lesotho is um, for just a, while the talk, topic is uh, talking about agriculture, if you look at the city and some of the statistics that don't produce any food to feed its growing population for more than 2 million, um, it is it's a primary source of income, import, supplementary source for, for half of the population. It's only about 10% of uh, Lesotho land is arable for agricultural purposes. Um, I'm going to just put, I'm not sure if my audio video is clear, but I'm going to put that up just from a network perspective. That's the other problem, uh, technology. So while you're doing these webinars remotely, um, we always face technological problems. So my talk or introduction in relation to the um, AFDFDA essentially speaks about um, what ultimately uh, the AFDFDA holds for potential African businesses on the continent, more so from an investment perspective, and as the other speakers will be unpacking it, um, also provide context to how um, African businesses can access preferences from, for agricultural goods and services on the AFDFDA, and also specifically highlighting the pitfalls and what is still required to, to be done by the AFDFDA secretary and the African Union and all the African Union member states to make sure that um, we actually ultimately fully realize the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So one of the, so the laudable objective of the AFDFDA is obviously to create an integrated market for both goods and services on the African continent. And if, you, if we talk about agriculture specifically, and I just looked at the statistics uh, that was released at the end of last year, um, um, this is with reference to the United Nations Economic Commission for, for Africa. It estimates that the agricultural sector generates about 15% or 100 billion US dollars of, of the continent's GDP. And although that is, it, it differs from country to country, it remains a critical part of sector for the continent. And from an employment creation perspective, for food security, and also to some extent export. And, um, and one example that I mentioned was the earlier being in the city, the city is a net importer of uh, basic food products. Um, and that just gives an, as an indication of the potential um, if we are able to realize the full value of the AFDFDA to um, the objective to, to eliminate tariffs, uh, to ensure there's a conducive environment for investment flow, uh, free transfer, of funds, the free movement of business travelers, and ultimately also the service sector, uh, which plays a critical role in ensuring that we realize the objectives of the AFDS. So um, we all can see there's significant potential, but there's also, if one look at, looks at various expert reports that have been released over the past uh, few months, before actual trade started under the the uh, the African continent of free trade area from the first of January. So there's a number of bottlenecks or hurdles that have been identified by um, leading institutions, and one of those are trade related investment in trade related infrastructure. And what do we mean by trade related infrastructure? Trade related infrastructure are roads, uh, railways, um, ports, and um, other related infrastructures such, such as telecom that we require to ensure that we can actually fully realize and benefit from what is contemplated under the laudable objectives of the AFDFDA. Without that, um, it will essentially just be uh, a pipe dream. Because, and and if, if we look at the infrastructure bottlenecks, um, there is an estimation, I think, by the African Development Bank that we, there, there's a significant capital investment requirement. And the capital investment will not just uh, come from government because government does not have the physical space or most African governments do not have the physical space to invest in these uh, infrastructure projects. And then, and then we need to look at the private sector. And for the private sector um, to invest in infrastructure and also related to that, invest in 
the value chains um, for for the to realize um, the benefits or preferences under the AFCFTA, you need investment. Now, one of the critical elements, and probably a, a big criticism also from our side to, to the current process, is one of the fundamental protocols, which is the investment protocol, which we actually need to ensure or need as part of the entire process to, to encourage investors on the African continent, both African investors and other investors, um, is investment protocol, which ultimately, the ultimate intention behind the investment protocol, similar to bilateral investment treaties and multilateral investment treaties, is to ensure that investors are protected against political risk. Uh, political risk um, in the sense of what we commonly would see from an African jurisdiction, not, not limited to Africa, but, and you get it in, in most other jurisdictions, it's um, nationalization, expropriation, unfair treatment, or what we will call the fair equitable treatment standard, uh, most favored nation principles, the free transfer of capital. So those are big considerations for investors when they decide to invest in infrastructure projects or even invest in creating value chains. So setting up a hub in, say, the DRC or setting up a manufacturing plant in the DRC for, for batteries or whatever the case might be. Those are considerations uh, that investors take into account when they say, what type of investment protection is in place for me to ensure that I invest and that investment is ultimately a catalyst for trade? Because without the investment being in place, it also impacts on the trade. So as I emphasize, the trade-related infrastructure and also related investment for, for value addition. Now, as I mentioned, the protocol investment is it's a critical in, um, instrument to foster intra-Africa trade and investment. Um, it is still being negotiated. It has, I think, negoti negotiations have started and has lagged uh, since last year because of the delay of the effective date for trade under the AFDFDA. There's also a number of other issues that Trudy will, will touch on in terms of what's currently happening with the protocol and goods. Um, the issues in terms of rules of origin for particular project, pro products, uh, which are critical also for investors to make decisions on value addition and the establishment of manufacturing hubs or uh, centers um, in various regional areas to, to, to fully benefit under the AFCFTA. Um, so from my side, that is a very critical component, and we hope that the Secretary and the African Union would also put uh, more effort in, in finalizing the investment protocol because without that protocol, it, it creates uncertainty for investors who intend to invest in key infrastructure projects that are required to ultimately um, fully realize the um, objectives and laudable objectives of the African continental free trade area. Um, what I must also point out is that on the investment side of it, so there's, um, if you look at the investment framework from an African, from an African con a continental perspective, there are obviously bilateral investment treaties, they are multilateral investment instruments, such as the SADC uh, protocol and finance and investment, um, which have to a large extent been watered down in terms of the protection. And one of the key critical protection mechanisms is ultimately an effective dispute resolution uh, process for investors and states. And because although there are a number of uh, jurisdictions on the African continent that have a robust judiciary, not all African states, uh, the judiciary is robust or people have perceptions against the judiciary in general. And I speak out of experience also in terms of currently we're dealing with an issue for investors in, in, in the situ and the Lesotho, the process uh, that the, the judiciary, specifically when I look at what happened in the past few days, are sometimes questionable. And investors would want to have recourse to at least a, 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 a multilateral investment process, either through investor state dispute resolution or multilateral investment court, similar to what is being proposed uh, by the European Union, uh, where Although there's a recognition that there is the judiciary in Europe is is is, is strong, there are also things that um, certain countries do not trust 
or investors do not trust the judiciary in, in relation to certain aspects because there's always the issue of homegrown advantage. Um, and it's important that from an African perspective, we try and re uh, deal with this effectively and ensure that whatever is ultimately in the investment protocol deals with all the issues that investors, in particular for, from a South African perspective, we look at South Africa being one of the biggest capital exporting uh, jurisdictions on the continent. Uh, South African investors would like to have guarantees that if they set up shop or a manufacturing plant or hub somewhere in risky jurisdictions that they have recourse um, against um, violation of fundamental rights, such as um, expropriation, compensation, unfair treatment, or most favored nation principles, um, free funds of capital, um, and all of those elements that ultimately ensure that whatever investment you make, you derive a return on your investment. So my last comment before I hand over to Trudy is that um, for AFC, FTA member states, there needs to be a bit of a fast track in relation to the development of the protocol. What all the other protocols and underlying instruments that are still being negotiated or agreements, um, because these are critical to make sure that we ultimately realize the objectives um, under the AFDFT. And there should also be a bit more transparency uh, by the African Union um, in relation to where these instruments are, what is the status of negotiation, what is actually in these instruments, because uh, there's a lot of speculation that goes into it. Um, specifically with reference to, again, the investment protocol. If you look at the, the draft and African code on investment, which we understand will be the basis for the investment protocol, but it's not clear because there's also uh, different views from different states. And I know South Africa has a very robust view on the issue of investor state dispute resolution and it's saying more mediation. So um, with on that point, I now want to then hand over to Trudy to unpack for us the AFCFTA agreement, the related protocols and developments with that, and also the specific from, from an agricultural perspective, um, what um, businesses, African businesses, can look out for and what the future holds. Thank you. Trudy, Thank you. Um, over to you. Thank you so much, Jaquil. Um, I do have some slides to share, so if you give me a couple of seconds, we should be able to, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a great pleasure to join you for this webinar focusing on the African continental free trade area and specifically on agriculture and fisheries and what the implications are for the provisions of the AFC FDA for South African business in these sectors. As Andre and Jake will have mentioned, the AFCFDA is an ambitious initiative to integrate the 55 member states of the African Union. So far, only Eritrea has not signed the agreement. The aim is to liberalize trade, to create an integrated market for services and goods, and also to facilitate the cross-border movement of capital and persons, which are also obviously critically important to facilitate intra-Africa trade. Boosting intra-Africa trade, which runs at about 15% of Africa's total trade, is a very important objective. So the aim is literally to increase trade amongst the African Union member states. It's also important to keep in mind that the AFCFDA is also a flagship project of the African Union. This is important, ladies and gentlemen, because of course, among the flagship projects of the African Union is the Agricultural Support and Development Program, CARDIP. So the synergies between that program and the AFCFDA are particularly important. There are a number of development initiatives to assist, for example, small scale agricultural producers in CARDIP, which are very, very important. Also, that resonates with our own ambition to develop our agricultural sector. Ladies and gentlemen, it's also important to note that there is significant global interest in the AFCFDA. And I'm mentioning this to pick up on the point that Jack Will has made related to the investment protocol. Keep in mind that if a foreign investor, it could be from China, the United States, any global source, establishes a commercial presence in one of the state parties, 
then in fact that enterprise becomes eligible for the benefits under the AFC FDA. So this could also mean increased competition in certain markets that we have to be cognizant of. Just a little bit of an overview of what the AFC FDA encompasses. It's a very comprehensive agreement. It consists of three phases of negotiations. We are currently still working on phase one, and this is what I will focus on. The protocol on trade in goods is particularly relevant for agriculture and fisheries. And if we follow right through to the annexes on the right hand side, this is for business where the detail about the provisions in the AFC FDA is to be found. The two top annexes, the schedule of tariff concessions and the rules of origin, those are still under negotiation. They are also the foundational requirements for a free trade area. So, of course, until they are in place, it is not possible to trade under the AFC FDA. But ladies and gentlemen, note there are other annexes here which are particularly important for agricultural and fisheries trade, notably those that relate to customs and border management, trade facilitation, the elimination of non-tariff barriers, and then specifically standards, sanitary and phytosanitary standards. And we'll say a little bit more about that later. Jack will has also mentioned dispute resolution. There is a protocol for the overall agreement on dispute resolution. This provides only for dispute resolution of the interstate variety. So private enterprises, third parties will not be able to bring um, disputes to the AFC FDA dispute settlement arrangement. Phase two of the negotiations, as Jacqueline has mentioned, this is just getting underway now and it will cover a protocol on investment, another protocol on competition, and also one on intellectual property rights. A third phase, which will run concurrently with the negotiations on phase two, focuses on e-commerce. This is an extremely important part of the development of the overall legal and institutional architecture of the AFC FDA. And the aim is that we should complete these negotiations by the end of this year. In terms of where we stand with the ratification, South Africa is one of the early countries that ratified the agreement. Jacqueline has also noted, of course, that Lesotho has also ratified. Indeed, here we have to take a look at the fact that South Africa and Lesotho belong to the Southern African Customs Union. This is the oldest functioning customs union in the world, SACU. Because we are a customs union, we negotiate tariff concessions collectively to protect the common external tariff and the common customs territory of SACU. Now, I have noted here, and this is particularly relevant to the launch of trade on the 1st of January this year, Botswana has not yet ratified the agreement. So at this stage, it is not possible for any one of the SACU member states to actually trade under the dispensation of the AFC FTA that was launched on the 1st of January this year. And I'll come back to this important point. Update on the negotiations, ladies and gentlemen. A decision of the 13th extraordinary session of the African Union Assembly. This is where the heads of state and government meet. They decided on the 5th of December last year to launch trade under the AFC FDA on the 1st of January this year. Despite the fact that the negotiations on the key elements that I've mentioned, rules of origin and tariff concessions are not yet complete. So what does this mean? It means effectively that trade is launched under what we are referring to as an interim arrangement. It means that in fact, trade will be possible under the tariff offers that member states have made to one another. This is of course always the very early stage in the negotiating process, but these tariff offers are now to be gazetted by the state parties, the countries that have ratified the agreement and trade will be possible under those tariff offers. 
provided a number of preconditions are met, and I'm going to have a look at those in more detail. One of the important preconditions is that trade under this interim arrangement is only possible for those products for which the rules of origin have been agreed. Now, the rules of origin, ladies and gentlemen, are often referred to as the fine print in the agreement. These are the requirements, the criteria that have to be satisfied in order for a product to qualify as an originating product of South Africa or Lesotho, as the case may be. They differ according to the different category of products. And usually for agricultural products, plant-based products, for example, the requirement is that they be wholly obtained so that they have grown in a particular location that bestows national origin on them. But when it comes to fisheries, for example, the rules of origin are quite complex and they would relate to issues such as the ownership of the vessel, the flag under which that vessel flies, the nationality of the crew members, and then matters related to, for example, the factory ships, which are very often extremely important for the expeditious processing of fish products at sea. Then, of course, it is also important that the domestic implementation processes be complete before trade can begin. Countries must be customs ready. What does that mean? It means basically that the tariff book must be updated to reflect this new AFC FDA column of tariffs, the tariff offer that South Africa, for example, has made to its partners under the AFC FDA negotiations, but also the new rules of origin must be published. So we see that there must be amendments to the Customs and Excise Act, for example. All of these have to be gazetted. Now for South Africa, a lot of these implementation processes actually took place just before the launch of trade on the 1st of January, and I'll share some of those with you. At this stage, 41 of the 54 member states negotiating the African continental free trade area have made tariff offers, and about 80% of all the rules of origin have been concluded. But it's often, ladies and gentlemen, the ones that are outstanding that are of interest and where the opportunities for trade actually are. I've mentioned phase two and phase three, as has Jack Will. Just very briefly, the modalities for the negotiations of tariff concessions are really important because it is only if the tariff offers that are made comply with these modalities that a country will be able to trade as of the 1st of January. Now, what are those modalities? First of all, 90% of tariff lines must be liberalized. I note that it is tariff lines and not trade that has to be liberalized. The remaining 10% is divided into two categories. 7% may be designated sensitive products and the remaining 3% may be excluded entirely from liberalization. This is the detail that we need to note from a private sector perspective. Will the products of interest, both in terms of export and import, be within the sensitive category of our export partner or import partner, or will they be excluded? Now, some of the criteria that have been agreed for a member state to designate a product sensitive or excluded include the following. Could be for food security reasons, national security, fiscal revenue, livelihood, or importantly, industrialization. So if this is a sector which is the focal point of, for example, an industrialization initiative in a country, it may well be excluded from liberalization. On the rules of origin, ladies and gentlemen, pertaining particularly to agriculture and fisheries, the following is important. If we take a look at the classification of goods, the harmonized system of classification, where we find the tariff codes, chapter three deals with fish products. 
the rules of origin for this entire chapter, all the tariff lines in that chapter are still being negotiated, so we can't trade those products yet. For other agricultural products that fall into the chapters 4 through to 24, you will note that there are specific products such as buttermilk and cheese, um, fish fats, prepared and preserved fish, and so on that are also not yet agreed. So where will the opportunities under the AFCFDA come from for South African business? In other words, who is negotiating with whom? Which new market opportunities are being opened? And this is particularly important, ladies and gentlemen, because the agreement states very clearly that member states have agreed that existing trading arrangements, existing regional economic communities will continue to exist. These will not change. And this means that if we take a look at the regional economic communities across the continent, SADC is one of those, and SAKU, which is a small subset of SADC, they will continue to trade under their existing trade regimes. Nothing changes as a result of the AFCFDA. So where are the opportunities for the member states of SAKU and SADC and for South Africa in particular? They are in this gray area. East Africa, North Africa, Central Africa and West Africa. We currently trade with our partners in those countries under the rules of the World Trade Organization. And this AFCFDA will now take a look at reducing the tariffs, making trade with those partners more attractive as a result of the better market access conditions that we will be negotiating. So that's where the opportunities will be found. Very briefly, ladies and gentlemen, the launch of trade on the 1st of January. This is the decision by the heads of state on the 5th of December last year. The details are provided in this document, and I'm very happy to share that in my list of resources at the end of the presentation. Let's look very briefly at a few of the salient points. The heads of state approved that trade can start on the 1st of January in terms of the schedules of tariff offers, provided they are in line with the agreed modalities. However, trade will only be possible if the reciprocity requirement is met. In other words, if one of our countries of interest, for example, Algeria, has not made a tariff offer that complies with the modalities, we will not be able to trade with them as of the 1st of January. Very important, as I've noted, trade is only possible as of the 1st of January for those products with agreed rules of origin. The others cannot yet be traded. The AFCFTA parties must also obviously be customs ready. Now the question is, and this is so important for the private sector, what happens as the negotiations continue and negotiations with particular partners are concluded? The decisions of those negotiations will have to be adopted and they will then be gazetted and they will then determine the rules for trade under the AFCFTA. So what we see is that an incremental process towards the full final AFCFTA will be unfolding in the com coming months. Very importantly, as we are members of a customs union, as I've mentioned, it's important that all the member states of the customs union ratify the agreement, or if they all agree that even if one or more of them have not ratified the agreement, the others may continue. Those of you colleagues who have been trading under the Trade and Development Cooperation Agreement with the European Union some years ago will recognize that a similar arrangement was act in, actually in place when South Africa unilaterally negotiated an agreement with the EU and the other SARCO members gave concurrence that we could actually trade with the EU 
rather than what is usual practice for a customs union, that we all negotiate agreements collectively to protect the common external tariff. Colleagues, I'm almost at the end of the presentation. This comes from the Government Gazette. It is available on the SARS website, and this indicates the amendment to the Customs and Excise Act, what happens on the 1st of January. And you will see, if you're able to see the fine print here, the two countries with which we are able to trade as of the 1st of January that meet all the requirements I've specified are Sao Tome and Principe, a very small island economy off the west coast of Africa, and Egypt. So we are not yet able to trade with any other um, of the AFCFDA negotiating countries. This below this table is the fine print, which is really important. So all the conditions that I have mentioned to you, you will find there. This is what the private sector needs to study very carefully. Our tariff book has duly been updated, and this was also gazetted on the 31st of December last year. And you will note right on the right hand side, this is the AFCFDA column. And this is the column for fresh or chilled fish fillets. And um, obviously because we have not agreed the rules of origin, despite the fact that we have tariffs in this column, we cannot yet trade in those products. This is the end of my presentation, colleagues. I have a number of slides with more detail on the specifics of trade under the AFCFDA, and I'm very happy to share those with you. I'm now very happy to hand over to my colleague, Wandile, who will be going through the details and the market opportunities under the AFCFDA. Thanks very much, Wandile. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Trudy, uh, for, for, for that. And uh, good morning, colleagues um, on the line. Um, Trudy and Jacqueline have already done a fantastic job of ensuring that uh, they cover the big picture of what the African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement is about. All I will do now is really to try and center the discussion to the points that Trudy had already started on um, within the agricultural sector. And I think this is important because in South Africa, we view agriculture as one of those uh, sectors that will continue uh, contributing to the economic growth uh, of the country, and especially now as we are recovering from the pandemic. But I also think that the important point there is that South Africa's agricultural sector is already export orientated. Uh, if you look in the values terms, we already export roughly 51% of the products um, that we produce. So if we are thinking about agriculture from a growth perspective and thinking about potential expansion, we really need to be looking for other markets. And I think what we are offered here, the details of what Jacqueline explained and Trudy really coming on and bringing the operations of how the trade agreements will pretty much work, those get to be important contribution as we try to think about how agriculture will participate um, in this uh, uh, agreement. And I'll make uh, my contribution on that point, but also try to make my contribution on a reciprocal point, because obviously South Africa cannot just look at the African continent as an area to send goods. We also have to be open on receiving some of the goods. And I think my contribution will largely be on those two uh, important points. And the charts that you are seeing on your screen really speaks to the initial points that I started out with. On your left hand side, for example, you are seeing the exports are dark blue bars and also imports of agricultural products. Just last year, for example, we were exporting about $10.2 billion of agricultural goods, but we also bring in in South Africa just on average about $6 billion worth of agricultural products, which is where I think the African continent uh, on the reciprocal mechanism 
mechanism will also have a market to play in in South Africa. But I think even more important for today's discussion, ladies and gentlemen, is the issue uh, on your uh, chart on your right hand side, because if you see the dark bluish line on that chart is the market that we are speaking about today, the important one on the African continent. But what's interesting on South Africa is that yes, 41% of what we export in agriculture goes to the African continent. But if you begin to ask to say where in the African continent are those exports actually going, roughly 80% of them are concentrated within the SADC region, which is just about 16 uh, countries that are there. The other countries that are outside of that is just a few like Nigeria and a few countries here and there. And which is why it's so exciting uh, to see what Trudy have already explained and Jacqueline has already explained in terms of the reach in which our goods now could uh, pretty much be able to reach on that African continent. So this is one of those points that I think um, uh, it's very important as we think about it here. And obviously on agriculture, we have to also consider what is it that the African continent is importing. And if you look at the pie chart on your left hand side, you will see a highlight of the top agricultural products that the continent pretty much brings in. And if you look at the nature of those, those are largely products that South Africa one way or another has a production of and we are actively looking for markets uh, for this. Even in a province, for example, that uh, many of the colleagues that are on the line are in, in the Western Cape, we were looking for barley markets and the African continent would over time increasingly be one of those important markets. For wine, this continue to get much more rich um, within the African continent. And already we are sending some of the products which we try to show on the chart that you see on your right hand side as to where South Africa's agricultural products are pretty much uh, 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 that are going to the, to the African continent at this point. And obviously one of the points, and this builds um, uh, to, 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 to the charts that Trudy showed earlier on, showing on where the tariff, but at the point she showed on the fishery side. But if you look at the, the, the wines, and I'm just a few horticulture space on why we see the African continent pretty much more exciting, you just have to look um, into those first uh, two columns, for example. The value uh, or the share of the exports of certain products that go to the African continent. For apples, Africa is already one of our biggest markets. About nearly 40% of our apples are going there. But for wine and oranges, the African continent is still pretty much um, a, a small market. But also more importantly is to look at the tariffs that are being applied in there. Because as we are small in our oranges and our wine and other commodities that I didn't show in this particular slide, there are some competitors that are enjoying relatively lower tariff rates than us. You think about oranges, for example, Egypt, Spain and the other countries are enjoying pretty much lower uh, tariff rates on average compared to us, uh, South Africa in the African continent. We pretty much um, are putting on a tariff, for example, of oranges of about 11%, while our competitors that I've mentioned are facing tariffs of about 4.7%. Now, over time, once we have gone through all of the stages that Trudy was explaining, we'll be able to have a far more better access in those markets, which is why I think that as we are planning agricultural expansion and some of the other horticultural products that are planned for expansion will pretty much come in line in the next eight, 10 years or so down the line. By that time, there will already be a place to send some of those goods at very lower tariff, which is great for the South African agricultural sector. But I think on a reciprocity mechanism, the African continent also needs to do a lot from its side. Because I mean, if you look at the products that South Africa imports, aside from wheat, palm oil and poultry, there are a couple of products that the African continent could pretty much look at South Africa and see how they increase their production of those products in order to take advantage of the South African market. The basic ones at which I think I show this as an example, if you look at the maize yields in, across the African continent, the, the, the productivity is pretty much low. You will see the top productive country being the United States, South Africa, Brazil in terms of tons uh, per hectare. 
and most of the African continent, uh, countries being very low there by Kenya, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe. But even if you were to aggregate on average and take South Africa out for various crops, not only cereals, either you're looking at horticulture and you're looking also on the livestock side, and you look at the productivity in the African continent, that is still very low. And I think that for the African continent to make the African continental free trade agreement much more important and, 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 and useful and beneficial for them, they also need to think about how do they increase the capabilities and their productivity on their side so that they can have goods, goods that they can take to market. And I think that's the, the, the important market, the important point that uh, those that are joining us from the continent really needs to think uh, deeply about how to go about productivity question. And obviously, increasing productivity in the African continent is not only helping for them to exporting to South Africa and the other countries, but also we deal with the issue of the of closing up the the that that trade balance that you see, for example, in the we remain net export importers of a number of food products in the African continent. The chart that you see on the board, the only important line that I would say focus on is the red line, and all that it says is that if you are looking on on a trade balance imports export of food products, the African continent still on the back foot. There's still a long way until we are able to cross that middle line that I've showed in there. And I think that boosting productivity will help there, but also will help to have volume so that amongst Africans, we could have those volumes that we are able to, to, to trade uh, amongst ourselves. And already, they, they, we don't be starting from stretch. There is a lot that is already happening. The key uh, flags that, for example, I've highlighted in there, it shows who are the net key importers of what products in the African continent and who are the key exporters of what products in the African continent. South Africa features on both sides, uh, but I think that increasing uh, productivity, the question I was, the point I was making um, in the previous slide will help a number of African countries to have more products that we can move amongst ourselves. And already that will contribute or increase this intra-trade that is already happening in the continent, which at this point is just over $24 billion. And I think more could be done in there. And obviously, major traded products are the one that we show maize, palm oil, and as well as sugar are the key products that we need to really be contributing on and making sure that we get a much more diverse basket than the ones that are already there. But the picture is not all um, as positive or as promising, um, at least in the near term, as the one that I've just highlighted. <clears throat> From previous experience, as Trudy, uh, to a certain extent, also pointed to this, there has been a number of non-tariff barriers or some number of, of things that have limited trade, even in, in previous uh, trade agreements, those ones that Trudy showed in the nice maps uh, that she highlighted in her, in, in her presentation. You think, for example, within the SADC region, while I was making a point that South Africa enjoys much more access in the SADC region, there are still a number of non-tariff barriers. Businesses will tell you a lot about uh, the cross-border issues either it's excessive documentation that actually happen administrative bottlenecks across the, the, the borders all of those they slow the incentive to pretty much be able to trade and I think that within the African Continental Free Trade Agreement these are some of the things that people like Wamkele who's leading um, who's a secretariat in there are pretty much looking at and I think that they need to receive uh, much more emphasis but I think at a governmental level at a broader level we really need to deal with the question around the infrastructure challenges because we could have all of these tariffs lowered, we could have everything done on paper, but that if the transaction costs of moving the products from Cape Town to somewhere in Niger or any other country in the continent is still high, people will still prefer markets outside the continent. And I think that those are the messages or key things that the governments across the continent really need to be paying more attention on. And obviously the unequal trade point is a very important one. I spoken a, a, a bit about it, but I think it's important in a sense that if many people feel that there will be a few uh, winners in all of these trade agreements down the line, it could cause us problems, which is why I think that boosting productivity, addressing infrastructure issues um, will ensure that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is much more impactful and beneficial for a number of countries that are pretty much participating um, here. And there another important point, which again, on Trudy's point uh, presentation, it was clear, it's on phase two, 
that is yet to be discussed. The issues around property rights, investments and competition policy, I think those are important. And only when we have been able to find our footing on those points, I think that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement as a PAC will pretty much be able to live up to that big ambition that Andre and the colleagues have explained um, at the start of this session. And colleagues, I will end my presentation there, but I think the key points to take home is that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement promises a good picture for South Africa's agricultural sector. We are already at a point where we are looking for more markets, but in the immediate term, I'm not as uh, optimistic. I do think that down the line after 10 years or so, as we progressively address infrastructure challenges, progressively address the issues that are on phase two of the agreements, only then we will be able to yield uh, a much more better uh, benefit out of this. And addressing specifically the points that are on that second bullet point that I'm showing on the screen there. I do think that those uh, needs to receive uh, really high priority. Otherwise, we will have the documents and have everything else uh, completed, but we won't be able to see the economic gains. And lastly, to the point that the African countries really need to think about agriculture as one of the sectors that they will be able to utilize as they come out of COVID. And Jacqueline made the point that agriculture already constitute roughly 15% of a number of countries' uh, GDP. And if you look at employment, about two thirds of people in a number of countries are working on an agricultural sector. Now, boosting productivity and increasing investments in there obviously might lead to a less people working on primary sector, but more opportunities on the value chain. And I think that with all of that produce and that vibrancy, that is when many people or many countries in the continent will pretty much be able to see the promise of this agreement. Let me stop there and uh, take it back to you, Jack. Well, thank you so much, colleagues, for listening to me. Uh, thank uh, you, Wandile. That was a very insightful oversight of the economic aspect of um, the AFCFTA. Let me just put out my video. I think that will be with it. Um, so for the participants, um, and thanks to you also, Turi, I think that you really uh, set out the entire framework specific to the agricultural sector and the benefits, but also the significant pitfalls and aspects that are still being negotiated uh, under the agreement to ensure that uh, there's, a, there's a full realization of the trade agreement. So what we're going to do now is, is essentially facilitate a session where I will Pose or the audience can pose questions uh, to uh, both uh, either Trudy or Wandile or both um, in respect of specific um, questions or concerns that you might have or particular issues in terms of the implementation, how business, African businesses can access um, the benefits under the preferences and how long that will take or any other specific questions here. So feel free to use the comment tab. And I will then facilitate your question, and, and Sudi and Wangili will, will will answer that. But maybe I can start with one question. Um, and I know Sudi and Wangili, as to, to an extent, also expresses public comment on on the AFCFTA, just broadly speaking. And one of the big criticisms um, of the AFCFTA or the start of trade from the first of January has been: uh, Have we not rushed? the process? Could we not have waited a bit um, for everything to be in place uh, before actually starting trading? Or is it is it good enough just to have a few members that can comply with the terms of the agreement and starting trade? As Suri also mentioned, uh, from an agricultural perspective, there's only two countries which South Africa effectively can trade with. So I just want to get uh, both Suri's and one dealer's comment on should we have waited? Because I think our the Secretary General has a different view, and he's very robust about um, why we started trading from the first of January 2021. Over to you, and then one delay. Thank you so much, Jack. Well, this is of course an extremely important question. It is highly unusual that an agreement enters into force and trade starts before negotiations are complete. So we really have not followed the rule book with the AFCFD. And part of the reason is, of course, that there is significant political support and expectations of what the AFCFDA will deliver for Africa. However, 
I think it is important to recognize that integrating eventually 55 member states of the African Union, which vary considerably in terms of economic size, levels of development, economic structures, levels of industrialization and agricultural development, is an extremely daunting task. And therefore, the agreement also specifies very clearly that this will be an incremental process. So it will take time. And our political leaders, the heads of state and government, um, in December took the decision, a very, very brave decision, I would say, to launch trade on the 1st of January. So what we will expect is an incremental process, but from a legal perspective and from a business perspective, this of course brings some challenges and complications because as I've mentioned, we are now trading under the tariff offers, or it will be possible to trade under the tariff offers, provided the other conditions are also met, but the negotiations are still continuing. So as negotiating outcomes are achieved, those have got to be adopted and therefore the tariffs will change. And, and I think Wandile's point on this is particularly important. We still are not sure exactly what tariffs we will face in our export markets. Although we know what the tariffs offer, tariff offers are of our counterparts, but they are still under negotiation. Um, but this is, as I mentioned, also a flagship project of the African Union. So it fits into the broad development strategy for the continent agenda 2063. And there's a lot of emphasis at the moment, a lot of complementary initiatives, which are extremely important. For example, support from the Africa Bank, Africa's Export Import Bank to develop quality infrastructure. This is critical for agriculture because standards, sanitary and phytosanitary standards and certification of products, traceability, all of these are so important when we're trading in agricultural products. So when we look at the broad compact, the AFC, FDA, other flagship projects, and the complementary initiatives, which also include a continental payment and settlement system, which again, Africsim Bank um, is launching and it will be piloting as from April, then there's a lot of support to integrate African economies, African markets, because it is unfortunate that the continent is still very fragmented. And as Wandile mentioned, it is the non-tariff barriers, the lack of infrastructure, and the lack of unharmonized regulations related to transport, to communication, to financial services that are in fact far greater barriers to intra-Africa trade than the tariffs. So it's a comprehensive undertaking, no mean task that lies ahead of us. And at this stage to see some progress, political leadership has made the decision to incrementally move towards the final full African continental free trade area regime for the continent. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, one delay. Uh, one delay. Yeah, uh, Jekyll, I mean, I agree uh, with pretty much all uh, that uh, Trudy has said on this point. But I, I would also just add and say, uh, yes, the, the, this was a, a political economy or political push from the leadership side, but also I don't think we could have been able to pretty much wait and say, let's see everything falling in place. Um, all investments either on infrastructure or, or boosting domestic industries of many industries, because that will take time. And I think that as much as uh, the political climate is changing for the positive or is setting to change for the positive, then the hope is that the investments uh, will follow. And over time, as tariffs also will not for many countries, uh, you know, uh, progressively go to, to, to zero or, or to, to lower rates instantly, but it will take over a couple of years to pretty much see those tariffs reducing. So starting right now, I, I don't think it was really um, a, a, a bad thing. But where I would caution on is the fact that there is not going to be a lot of immediate gains, at least for South Africa's agricultural sector, out of this in the in the near term. I don't think that within the next two years or so, uh, we'll be able to really yield much fruits in here. Perhaps we could continue putting our efforts in all of the other markets that we, 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 we've been traditionally uh, in, while hoping that 
10 years, eight years down the line, we could begin to see the fruits of what's going on in the continent. Thank you, Wandile. I think just a follow up on, on the statement that you've made, and I think it's important for South African and African businesses. So when do you start getting ready? Um, in a sense, when do you start um, developing strategies or business initiatives in relation to ultimately deriving the benefit under the uh, the agreement, either on the protocol on goods or the protocol on services. So, um, because I think for, for businesses, it's important to understand what do they do now? Do they wait and see, or do they start implementing whatever processes and strategies um, in relation to what will happen, whether that's two years or three years or four years from now? Um, what would your advice be? Maybe start, I start with you again, one deal, and then I go to Trudy. Yeah, I, I, I think I think for South Africa's um, agribusinesses, I mean, get, getting ready. Um, I would say, Jacqua, we are pretty much um, already there because what what all we need to do, I think, from an industry side, is firstly having the sufficient volumes that we think we could be able to uh, uh, put uh, in, as that demand from the continent uh, will arise. Um, and I think if if you think, for example, take the citrus industry. Uh, from between now and 2030, we are expecting to see growth in volumes of roughly about 76%. Obviously, that will not all go to the EU where we have been big at or to the Middle East or to the Asian market, which is why then I was making also the example of oranges and the tariffs and the, and the stuff um, in, in, in one of the slides. So. In one sense or another, the agribusinesses or the agriculture in South Africa, because by nature of what we are doing, it takes years for us to see those outputs. And the investments in a number of subsectors are already made, and all the projections from five years on, if you've talked to folks that are either in the avocado space, um, to folks that are either uh, 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 across the citrus or even in, in grains, uh, there is a hope that five years from now, that's where we will see it, the volumes of the produce that we, we, we are producing pretty much uh, coming online. So in that sense, we will pretty much be, 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 be able to have the volumes to put in the market. And then another thing then, aside from that, it will lie more on the points that Trudy was speaking about. All of the legal stuff that needs to be done on ensuring that the movement of goods is pretty much relatively smoother. That's the key thing. And obviously, the, the, the question of infrastructure on getting into all of these markets, I mean, it's a difficult one because then whose responsibility is it for those governments um, that, that are in those countries? Because you can deal with infrastructure in as far as South Africa is concerned, which is why, I mean, if you talk to folks at Actors, for example, we actively now looking at Japan, we're actively looking at Saudi Arabia, we're actively looking at India and China on expanding for the very same products that I was mentioning. Because the risk here is that you cannot put your eggs on the African continental side and then the transaction cost gets to be so high to the extent that you can't really yield these benefits in the next five years. But if you have Japan, which is aging and its agricultural uh, activities declining, um, and then they are open for South African beef, then you will be able to have all of those uh, markets in there. So the risk is infrastructure and the investments that the African continent will make in there, and also some of the legal technicalities that uh, are, are truly what, what was responding to. But in as far as readiness, I think within the next five years, we will be ready and having some volumes that will be sufficient and looking for a place to go. And obviously our demand will also be growing, which is where I think that 6 billion products that we are bringing into South Africa, 6 billion worth of agricultural products, 6 billion dollars worth of agricultural products, the African continent should also be looking at South Africa and saying, what is it that South Africa is spending on? Because we are one of the big spenders when it comes to food in the in the continent. And they too should be taking advantage on the practicalities of the South African market. And I mean, it depends to them then, and also dealing with the quality issues, phytosanitary issues that Trudy was, was relating on, so that they are able to produce the products that will meet the South African standards and be able to come into our market. So it's a it's a complex one, but I think five years or so, it's a it's a it, it's probably um, my estimation of the time at which agriculture will be active. Uh, Trudy, your view on that? Thank you very much um, to Wandile for raising those issues. I think the agricultural trade. 
um, from South Africa has in recent years made extremely important inroads onto the African continent. And Wandile has mentioned, for example, the Apple success story globally, of course, citrus is, is one of the important success stories. But if we take a look at our trade last year during COVID, we find that our wine exports increased. Trade took a knock across the world, but wine exports from South Africa actually increased. Very important also, I think, the opportunities for sourcing agricultural inputs to develop our agro-processing industry. Have a look at the opportunities across some of the subregions with whom we may not be trading very intensively at this stage. North Africa, Western Central Africa, for example, where agricultural potential and the capacity to produce the kind of products which we can add value to will be very important. Now, those kind of value chain linkages are so important and they're impacted by rules of origin. One of the important aspects of rules of origin are the accumulation provisions. In other words, where can you source inputs from while still meeting the originating requirements? And of course, under the AFCFDA, we can source from any other state party under the AFCFDA, so literally across the continent. And I think in herein lies a lot of opportunities. So taking a look at, at possible value chain linkages, of course, also will meet the challenges related to non-tariff barriers, high transport costs, um, maintaining your value chains, the cold chains, and, and, and so on, which are extremely important. And this is why taking a step back and looking at the African continental free trade area, not only as a free trade agreement, but as one of the flagship projects of the African Union, together with all of the complementary initiatives that are designed specifically to support this integration initiative is really important. There are a lot of sector development projects under the African Union auspices, but also under our various regional economic communities. These all offer opportunities because let's be honest, South Africa has to some extent a first mover advantage. Our wholesale retail logistics distribution services um, are operating very efficiently across most of the continent already. And for agricultural products, which are time sensitive, temperature sensitive and so on, that is a huge advantage. So the role of trade and services where South Africa's services sectors um, have already got a foothold in many, many, many African markets is extremely important to support our agricultural trade initiatives, both exports, but also importing from the continent. Thanks very much, Jack Paul. Thank you, Trudy. Um, I just have, there's a few questions from the audience. Um, I'm just going to read out, um, let me start with the earlier ones. So there was a question from Magda, and she asked, um, when will this roll out to other industries than agriculture and fisheries? Um, and uh, maybe uh, Tulio Wandile can, can answer that, but just for, for Magda's benefit, it's a, it's a uniform standard for all industries, but they're just specific um, rules being negotiated for particular products. But Tulio and Wandile can, can maybe just expand on that specifically. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, do you want to go first? Yeah, I mean, all to, to say to Magda, uh, Trudy, you, you will come after me, is that I emphasized agriculture and talked about that because that's where I work. Um, but the, 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 it's, it's a comprehensive trade uh, agreement and a number of areas that, Trudy, you could highlight. Thanks very much, Wandile. That's absolutely true, Magda. It's a comprehensive trade deal, which means it covers all goods, all services eventually. When it comes to trade and services, we're focusing on five priority services sectors, transport, communication, financial services, professional services, and tourism. But other services sectors will be added, in fact, South Africa has already expressed interest in adding distribution services because we do have a competitive advantage in wholesale logistics and distribution services. So one has to look at the overall compact, 
which has extensive and comprehensive coverage. So industrial products are, are very much part of the deal as well. This is a very interesting area because, of course, we're now looking at linkages between agriculture and industry. So moving across into exploring the opportunities through our industrial and um, development policies, activities and how they complement what we're doing in terms of promoting our agri agricultural development. So it, it really is important to look at the deal as, as a comprehensive one. Um, when it comes to services, services are regulatory intensive. So the issues around regulation, regulatory cooperation and harmonization are extremely important. And this is where we could see benefits being unlocked, for example, in terms of reducing costs of transport, road transport. That is one of the priority services sectors and road transport still carries about 80-85% of intra-Africa trade. Extremely important if we are going to be efficient exporters. Again, it's a sector where South Africa has an advantage through our logistics and, and distribution services. So Magda, it is a comprehensive deal, but from an agricultural perspective, there are specificities related to standards the sanitary and phytosanitary measures, extremely important. The non-tariff barriers, the delays at border posts. So if we have improved customs and border management and we move towards digital trade solutions and e-certificate of origin, for example, that improves efficiency and the competitive gains that we can make as a result of, of those developments. And there certainly is a lot of focus at the moment on the development of apps the AFC FTA Secretariat is really pushing the digital trade agenda. So we've got to watch that space because, of course, each member state will have to adopt those solutions at a national level. So e-payments, e-certificates and e-applications will, will bring enormous gains and certainly they can benefit the agricultural sector as well as the industrial sector. Thanks, Jacqueline. Uh, thank you, Trudy. Um, then there's a few other questions by the audience. I know we have about um, 19 minutes left. Uh, there's a question from uh, Rihanna De Lange, um, and the question is directed specifically to Trudy. Uh, Trudy mentioned two countries in South Africa, in it, two countries, if they are able to trade with now. Are you aware of any trade between other African countries that have taken place since the 1st of January 2021 and a value to that if it's taken in place? So I think that's more not specific to the agricultural sector, but broadly trade. Thank you, Judith. Uh, you the question. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rihanna. Thanks, Jacqueline, for that question. This is, of course, extremely important. We're waiting to see what the trade data will show up, but we don't have any um, data yet to have a look at. These two countries have met all the requirements that I specified um, in, in the presentation. So we are able to trade as of the 1st of January with Sao Tome and Principe and with Egypt. I just want to add a little bit of a footnote as far as Egypt is concerned. We do understand that Egypt is reconsidering its tariff offer, and it is absolutely legitimate to do that because it is indeed a tariff offer. It's the opening round of the negotiations, if you will. So we need to watch what Egypt might do. As far as other trade across the continent, we do hear, for example, that some trade may be starting from Ghana, and um, that's, of course, where the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat is based. So there's a lot of focus on the host country. But at this stage, I must say, um, from the monitoring that we're doing, I don't see trade really flowing under the AFC FDA at this stage. It is very much still work in progress, but it's an important start and it's highlighting the important potential that the AFCFDA can have, but a reminder to us that the benefits will be incremental. It will take time. But I want to come back to a point that one dealer made earlier on, and some of the benefits that we really are looking forward to 
as a result of the AFC FDA relate to what economists tend to call the dynamic benefits, the attraction of investment. And this is a particularly important contribution. We're seeing significant global interest in the AFC FDA because the attraction of larger markets with the elimination of non-tariff barriers, facilitation of trade, better customs and border management becomes much more attractive than a fragmented collection of small markets on the continent. So watch the space on investment. I think this is certainly where significant benefits also for joint ventures, for partnerships, for value chain development certainly could be important. Thank you, Jack Will. Thank you, Trudy. And um, in just one delay position on that, and uh, just a, a last point, one delay needs to unfortunately leave us at 20 past uh, 10, and we really do value his insight and, and on this topic. Uh, so just a last comment maybe on this. Thank you, Wendy. Th th thank you so very much, uh, uh, Jacquel. And I think on the, on the last comments uh, uh, for, for me, I mean, I, I would again um, go back um, to, to the point that Trudy is making the space for investments. And I think until that investments are done, done more on a logistical basis to enable the movement of goods, the industries that are similar to the one that I'm sitting on on primary agricultural side, it's only then that I think we'll be able to, 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 to enjoy those benefits. But I think another important point that came on uh, from Judy's previous um, remarks, it's around the regional value chain, because I think those are important. You think about South Africa's poultry sector, for example, we can never be able to have a much more robust poultry sector until we have affordable soybeans. Now, if we can think about in the African continent to say, out of this half a million soybean oil cake that South Africa gets to from South America, is there one of the other countries that can actually specialize on boosting up its soybean uh, production and processing in the continent and see how it takes advantage of some of the markets like South Africa. Then until those regional value chains are done, there will be commodities specific um, and I think that they will largely be directed by private sector because people will be knowing where they can get or grow certain products at a much more uh, profitable way and I think that as integration happen the flow of that information will also be present and those opportunities of investment will bring that dynamism and that energy that is needed for our, all of us to pretty much see the gains um, of this but I'm very thankful uh, to you and the colleagues that joined us on the line um, and also for being part of this webinar. Thank you, Jaguar. Thank you, Wendy. We really do appreciate your input. Um, we will be talking to you again soon on other initiatives, but thank you. Um, then we're almost done, so there's about 15 minutes. And one thing that I also wanted to ask, and Judy can maybe unpack that for us in a bit more detail, is the question around trade and services, because I think if we look at the projection trade and services actually is, will play a much bigger role um, in terms of the economic growth of the continent. Um, and on that point, I also just want to mention that from a CDA's perspective, we are expanding our reach on the continent. So we are uh, opening up an office in Kenya, uh, joining forces with Kit Advocates, a very esteemed um, boutique uh, law firm that provide services in Kenya and the East Africa region. So with our base in, in Johannesburg, Cape Town and Stellenbosch, the service in the Southern African region, the addition of these advocates of this contributes uh, to being able to provide our clients services on the entire continent. Um, and it also goes to the issue of trade and services and that's why I mentioned it. So um, please, um, if you don't mind to maybe just deal a bit on the issue of trade and services for the agriculture agriculture sector, because I know there's a lot of in negotiations are on the way with that part of the protocol. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jacqueline. And just to to pick up on your 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 information that you're sharing about CDH's rollout across the continent, um, I think CDH, if I if I may speculate on this, sees significant opportunity across the African continent, and this 
expansion would be very much related to the professional services negotiations under the AFC FDA legal services being one of those specific subcategories of legal services. Now the role out of professional services across the continent is extremely important also for agriculture. So the support services, whether it's accounting, legal and other services are very important in order to facilitate um, trade transactions ac across the continent. To be able to provide these services in other jurisdictions, of course, we have to take a look at issues such as the mutual recognition of qualifications. So the negotiations when it comes to services are regulatory intensive. It is really the domestic regulation that matters. If we take a look at the other priority services sectors, transport, financial services and communication services, these are all absolutely relevant to agricultural trade, trade integration, value chain development and investment opportunities across the continent. Again, this is where there are significant opportunities to integrate our financial services sector further into the rest of the continent. South African financial services providers, commercial banks, insurance companies and so on are already well represented, but there are still regulatory barriers and bottlenecks that exist in some of the countries across the continent. Keep in mind that of course, different legal regimes apply to different sub regions. And, and this means therefore that the negotiations have to come down to the very specific details of those domestic regulations. When it comes to transport regulations, issues such as harmonizing axle load limits, it sounds like such a simple example, but so important in terms of your consignment. What weight carrying capacity do we have for the road networks across the continent? And at this stage, they differ significantly. In the face of different axle load limits, we actually devolve down to the lowest common denominator, and that's an efficiency and a competitiveness compromise. So looking at those details becomes extremely important. Communication services, cost of data, for example, across the continent connectivity, which is of course also related to energy security, um, which is not yet on the agenda, but hopefully it will be soon, needs to be factored in as well. The fact that we are still negotiating these issues on the trade and services agenda provides a window of opportunity. And that window of opportunity also still exists when it comes to the agricultural trade negotiations both on rules of origin, but also on tariffs. And I really would encourage private sector participants to take up that opportunity. If you see a specific opportunity in a market across the continent, one of those countries that we are negotiating with, contact the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition and highlight those opportunities because now is the time to make those inputs so it can still be incorporated in the negotiating process. Tra coming back briefly to trade and services, Jack, well, the trade and services contributes across the continent on average more than 50% of economic activity, but services are also trade facilitating issues. We cannot trade without the support of a range of services, professional services, the legal contracts, because behind every international trade um, transaction, there are of course private contracts that have to be concluded as well. So this really emphasizes the role of trade and services in facilitating cross-border trade on the continent. And it makes the services and the services offering of, for example, CDH extremely important to support our trade integration initiative across the continent. Thanks, Jack Will. Thanks, Trudy, um, for, for unpacking that and, and the importance of uh, trade and services for ultimately achieving the goals of having a free market and fully realizing the AFDFT. Without that, as you pointed out, um, we can't really achieve it uh, fully.
Then one other question, and I, we have a few minutes left, and I will also give Andre the opportunity at the end just to say his uh, closing remarks. But a question from one of our colleagues, uh, Joe Nisa, his question relates to olive oil. How does one find out where there is a need for product in Africa and what tariffs are applicable, uh, et cetera? This is, and thank you, Jack. Well, this is an extremely important question. And this question can, of course, be replicated for any other agricultural product or industrial product. Now, a very important complementary initiative. In fact, I have a slide in, in the deck that, that I will be sharing with you relates to the African Trade Observatory. This is a web portal where trade and trade related information is being made available. It's an initiative by the African Union Commission, the AFCFTA Secretariat and the International Trade Center based in Geneva. And you will be able to search for a particular product, olive oil, for example, take a look at market opportunities, but also a, do a competitor analysis, see who else is supplying that particular market. You will be able to find the applicable tariffs, but also the rules of origin and very importantly, the sanitary and phytosanitary measures that you will have to comply with the SBS certification that you will have to to meet in order to export to a particular country under the AFC FDA. So there are a number of other additional portals. Of course, you can go directly to the website um, of the, the country of interest to which you want to export or from which you want to import. Take a look at the applicable regulations there. But the African Trade Observatory is an extremely important initiative to bring together all of this information in one portal, but also very importantly, to bring together the information on market analysis and market opportunities for both import and export. Thanks, Jack Paul. Really, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I think that, that fully answers the question in terms of how you can identify where the opportunities um, on the content for specific products and the data considerations. Um, so my closing remark would just be to say thank you to you and also thank you, Carla, because I think your contribution um, towards this uh, international trade law and trade law on the continent is, is very important. Um, I regularly um, you go to your website, read your article, so it's, it's really a great contribution to the development and um, growth of international trade law on the continent. So uh, from the CDH, I want to say thank you, and then I want to hand over to uh, Andre to give the closing remarks. Thank you, Jackal. Um, in closing, I just want to thank all the speakers today. Um, um, it, thank you for your time and thank you for this very valuable contribution that you've made. It is really truly a pleasure to listen to such experts in their field. And I think all the attendees will, will attest to that. I then also want to thank everybody for attending this webinar. Uh, we trust that you found it very informative and also of value to your businesses. If you have any other questions or any follow-up questions, please send us an email and we will address them. Um, so thank you, goodbye, and have a nice and pleasant rest of the day. <laughs>